my name is Jen Wilson. I'm a senior programmer with Film Independent. Today we're doing a Q&A for the film The Painter and the Thief, uh, which won the uh, World Cinema Documentary Special Jury Award for Creative Storytelling at Sundance Film Festival in January. The film comes out um, in virtual cinema in the United States uh, on Friday. Um, I'd like to welcome the, uh, the director, Benjamin Ree. And the film's two subjects, Barbora Kizakova and Carl Bortel Nordland. Welcome, welcome, and thank you so much for doing this Q and A with me. Um, thank you for having us. Congratulations Hello. on your award at Sundance. Did did you all get to attend Sundance in January? Uh, it was only Barbara and me that got to attend attend the Sundance. Unfortunately, Bakil couldn't uh, enter the U.S. because of his criminal. He was too busy. <laughs> <laughs> he was so so busy uh this film is so um intensely dramatic at times but feels so rewarding in the end uh it feels so rewarding that uh the at the end of the journey um do you want to talk benjamin about um how you met barbara and and when um when you at what point you got involved in making the film? So uh, I began researching back in 2016 art uh, robberies. Uh, so I had the fascination for that uh, because art is kind of high culture and uh, robberies are kind of low culture. So there's a contrast there that I was fascinated about. So uh, during my research period, this story was on the front newspapers. Uh, in in Norway, so I followed the case uh, in the uh, newspapers and, uh, and and the news on TV, and I took contact with Barbara after this. So I began filming Barbara and Bakil when they had met approximately four times. Uh, so I came in quite early. Uh, fortunately, we had a lot of archival footage before I came along. So we had uh, a friend of Barbara documenting her life taking photos of the, her paintings being made, the exhibition. We had surveillance footage from the robbery. And, um, and we had uh, the, the audio from the, the court uh, uh, break. Uh, so, so we had everything we needed before I came along. So that was very fortunate. So that was how the story came about. And initially, initially it was meant to be a 10-minute, a documentary film for web TV in in Norway uh, because I did not know anything where the story might end up. Uh, I just found both Barbara and and Kalbakti very fascinating, and the kind of the setup that Barbara had uh, approached Kalbakti in the trial to to paint him. I thought that was a great setup. Uh, so I knew nothing, but I just kept on filming. And of course, as you see in the film, there's a lot of surprises there <laughs> coming up that I knew nothing about uh, would would uh, would happen. So, uh, Barbara, what, what, how did you feel when Benjamin um, approached you uh, for the idea for this film? What made you uh, sign on to do it? Well, you know, these things don't happen every day. Uh, first of all, not every day somebody steals your painting. <laughs> uh, so when Benjamin uh, called me, uh, I was just like, yeah, what's there to lose? So let me meet him. And I was actually very surprised what for a young man or a young gentleman Benjamin is. I thought somehow the documentarist must be a little bit different age. So that was quite the first big surprise. And I quite fast felt that Benjamin is really very kind person and very sensitive. I had to take this into account because of course uh, of Bertil. Um, to even start to consider whether I should get in touch with Bertil to ask him, of course, how he feels about it. Um, I was very happy that Bertil said yes. And if you ask me for my reason, the true reason why I decided to do it, so then let me take you a few years later when Bertil once visited me at my atelier. And the filming was already running, so it was somewhere in the middle. And uh, we once met. Uh, without the camera. And then we, with Bertel, started to speak about the filming. And I actually, uh, or he asked me why I decided to go for it. And I told him that actually he was for me the main reason to do it. Because I knew that the, 
life story of Bertel is incredible and all the struggles he's been going through and all the stigmas he had to fight with. And I just wanted to show in this story to the people what may happen if you put on the site any prejudices that you might obviously have around. And then I asked Bertil why he decided to do it. And if I recall well, Bertil, you said that you basically do it for me and for my art. <laughs> <laughs> I was very lucky there. <laughs> so you're both extremely selfless. Um, <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh, so this, this all starts because you decided to approach him that fateful moment when you decided to approach him in the in the courtroom in his trial for stealing your paintings what was your original motivation to speak to him to try to get your paintings back or was it for some other reason or i did not have any thought of i could this way try to get my paintings back um I, I came to the courtroom already with the thought of that I wanted to approach both of the thieves because they were two thieves. Um, and this all, as a concept, came up to my mind after talking with my boyfriend, Oysten Sten, who is an exquisite writer and who has very good feeling for a story as such. And so, of course, he then encouraged me to, like, this is really a situation that not many artists can meet. And I understood there comes certain obligation for me to do something with it as an artist. So my first thought was to ask both of the guys whether they would pose for me while I would recreate the crime scene, like how they remove my canvases from the blind frame. But um, it all ended up in a little bit different way, as you might know. I came to the courtroom and uh, there was Bertil only. And very soon, this kind of basic thought or the first thought of making this uh, thievery crime scene really just disappeared because I could not see any criminal in Bertil. Really, not at all. So it came out different. For, for Bertil... Uh, what did you think of Barbara when she came up to you and started talking to you? Was that frightening for her to introduce herself as the, the victim of your uh, theft of the art? Um, I didn't feel uh, particularly uh, big that day. Uh, of course, uh, when she approached me, I felt I owed her that much, so it was no question if I wanted to. Of course, I, I'll be there for her. But uh, I think it was more frightening for her. Why do you think so, Bertil? <laughs> no. <laughs> I have to say, uh, you know, watching this, everything in me, you know, there's a tension. There's, there's a lot of tension in it because every, everything in me sort of said, I don't think, I really don't think she should go down this path and get involved with them. Um, but, but you do. Benjamin, my question for you is, it's, you know, the, the movie's not only told from Barbora's perspective, but from Bertil's as well. Did you originally conceive of that structure? And that's why you did two separate interview processes with them, because you wanted both sides of their story or your idea for the structure of the film sort of came later during the making? Uh, the idea for the structure came in the editing room. Uh, so we was editing the film for eight months. We had a lot of footage, been filming for almost three years. So um, I wanted to get across what an intelligent, funny and charismatic guy Bakil uh, is. Uh, and uh, the only way to do that, I felt, was to show uh, the, the world from his perspective. And I also thought it was a bit of fun because that's very unexpected. Uh, because kind of the, the cliche of the genre of uh, this uh, artist and muse uh, film is that you only see the world from the, the artist's point of view. 
So I thought it was very fun to play with that, that we would change perspectives uh, so we would see the world from Carl Buckley's point of view. And the, the, the themes we are exploring in the film is what we humans do in order to be seen and appreciated and what it takes of us to see others and help others. So uh, to see the world from two perspectives also added uh, complexity to uh, the themes of the film. So I'm really curious uh, to, uh, for, for Barbara and um, Bertil, um participating in a, a documentary for many years. Um, I'm not sure, Benjamin, how many years you were filming them. Uh, was it three or three years? Uh, we were filming for three years, approximately three, three years, yes. I'm just wondering how that changes your life um, when you have a camera on you so much of the time. Did you, were you aware of the camera being around a lot or did it sort of, did Benjamin and the camera sort of disappear for you sometimes? Bertil, go ahead. <laughs> for me, the camera just disappeared. Uh, pretty soon, you get used to. I felt safe. I felt safe with Benjamin and with Christopher who was filming. So I didn't I didn't think a lot about having the cameras. I had a lot of struggles, so I had uh, my thoughts on other things, and uh, I felt safe with Benjamin. And for me, I though I of course had absolutely no struggles at all compared to Bertil at that time. But I have to say that really, uh, exactly as Bertil says, both Benjamin and the photographer Christopher were or are such sensitive people that even for me without big struggles in my life, I really happened to really forget about there is any camera around. So they turned, as they say, uh, this uh, film Terminus Technicus, they became flies on the wall. Were there times when he would call and you just did not feel like being filmed and sort of had to force yourself or times that you didn't want to continue with the story? Not for me, but I'm sure Bertil has more to say about that. Yeah, of course, there were some scenes that uh, uh, at least one time when I was going to rehab uh, that I told Benjamin that uh, this, uh, this scene should not be in the movie, uh, should be deleted. But I think uh, I called him the next day and, uh, and told him to really bring that scene to the movie to, to, show, to show people how it really is. Benjamin, the, the times that you were filming in the prison, is it difficult to get access to prisons in Norway to film? Um, no, it's not uh, difficult. Um, Halden prison, which is the fil uh, prison we were filming in, is quite a famous prison because like Michael Moore has been there. There's been some Netflix documentaries that have got access to the prison. So, um, uh, so how did we get access? Like the boss of the Holland prison is the one that uh, is in charge of this. So when you walk up the, the corridors to the boss of uh, Holland prison, you can see a lot of uh, pictures of him with filmmakers, like a, <laughs> a hall of fame. <laughs> Uh, so it was just uh, to go there and ask for permission and we got permission and we filmed in the prison for eight months and the only difference between filming outside prison uh, was um, that inside the prison we had to have one person following us around all the time to open the doors and lock the doors and make sure that, uh, uh, that we could go places. That's amazing. It's not like that in the United States. <laughs> it's very hard to film in prisons in the United States. Um, Barbara, we're, when you first saw the interviews that Bertil had done uh, by himself, because there's a, a quite an, an extensive part where he's describing your life and he's describing your art and describing your background, were you sort of stunned by what he had taken in about you? Um, good observation of you and therefore a good question because yes, 
though of course friendship is a mutual mutual uh, relationship but um many times or let's say yeah for some years let's say the main focus was on bertil for me because he was having his quite big struggles and i just felt like it's my duty to be there for him to help and to pay attention to him and i understood there was not much of a space in him probably to uh, see me as much but then when i first saw the scene that you described where bertil says that whether i know that i he also sees me um this was actually for me one of the most emotional moments in the film for me to experience as a spectator i'm wondering if that moment for you was like the moment when bertil sees the first painting that you've done of him do you think it was similar because you should ask him <laughs> For Till, <laughs> do you think her emotional reaction was like yours when you, do you want to talk, that's such a special moment in the movie when you first see Barbara's first painting of you. Um, do you want to talk about what you're feeling in that scene? Uh, um. Everybody asks about that scene. <laughs> uh, it may, maybe it was one of the first moments in my life I felt like somebody saw me. And I knew the amount of hours Barbara had used making this, uh, this painting and that she could take something worth as little as I felt myself that, at that time and make some make something that beautiful out of out of me uh, yeah um so this this the second half of the movie really seems to focus uh because there seems to be a time period when, when after the accident when Bertil goes to jail when uh barbara you're not returning his uh, messages or phone calls. And then the film sort of starts to focus on you and your struggles um, as an artist and your struggles in life and your relationship with your boyfriend. Um, were you just taking that time for yourself? Uh, the time period when you weren't speaking with Bertil? Well, the thing is, first of all, I'm highly phone phobic person. So I very often don't reply phones when it rings, especially not when I paint, because then it just takes me out of my bubble and I very seldom I'm willing to do it. We, of course, spoke. I also did pick up the phone when Bertil called me from the prison. I also came to visit him a couple of times. So it's not that we were disconnected. We sent each other's letters as well. Um, of course, there was a, a, a big difference of him suddenly for eight months not being able to come and pay me a visit in my atelier. Uh, that was quite a difference. But whether I took more time for uh, my own struggles, uh, hell no. I mean, I'm in my <laughs> struggles all the time uh, the same way. So. <laughs> so uh, I want to ask about the last scene of the movie, which um, actually I want to ask two things. I want to ask about first about the importance of swan song because I don't think the movie would have happened if you didn't have such a strong feeling for the two paintings that were taken. And I think it says in the movie, he, they happen to have taken the two most important pieces to you. Uh, can you talk about why the work Swan Song is so important? Um, well, first of all, every painting I make is my sort of uh, creation. It's my sort of a baby. So they all are really precious to me. The Swan Song, was a little bit special in the way that it was the first piece I made uh, after I moved from Berlin, Germany to Oslo. And it was kind of my most conscious way how I wanted to deal with my little bit troublesome past with my previous, um, not the most perfect relationship. So 
it was also quite symbolic that actually this painting was stolen exactly for that reason of what uh, it what made me to make this painting uh, so it was for me maybe even more of a sign like i just should really put it uh, outside of my head my past and move on <laughs> and the chloe and emma um, that was a painting i made in berlin and these were two girls that I met just randomly on the wedding of my friend in Berlin. And that was in a gorgeous place in the center of the city. It's called the Spiegelsaal, the, the, Saal, the Hall of Mirrors. And these two girls were suddenly just sitting on that sofa. And they actually were sitting there as if they were waiting for me to paint them like that. So I actually shouted at them, like, don't you dare to move. I ran back for my strange small uh, mobile phone at the time and I took a kind of strange picture. And then I happened to turn it into the painting. And uh, there I realized that even though I'm trying to make a portrait of just two five years old girls that are just cute, I happened to sneak in something little spooky in it and I don't know why. <laughs> So it was kind of special painting as well for me that even the cuteness can be spooky. It sounds kind of um, kooky to say this, but that painting, for me, even just seeing it on a you know in a movie and not being able to see it up close, that painting does exude a lot of power. When Thank I you. saw it again when I watched the movie for the second time and saw it again, I was like, there's something really mesmerizing about this painting and the power of it just comes through every time you see it. It's, I think it's a magnificent work. So congratulations. It Thank does. you. I just want to say that I'm now planning to make a new version of Chloe and Emma after seven years. So I'm oh. going to meet the girls after seven years at the same place. And I wish to do it each seven years, like to see the development of them each seven years. That's awesome. Years, so. That's <laughs> totally awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, so. Every seven years, then? What do you say, <laughs> Do I have to go to jail every seven years, then? <laughs> My dear, you didn't go to the jail because of the painting. <laughs> <laughs> but be so, my guest. My last question to wrap up is this question sort of arises in the movie about whether you can actually save somebody. Um, we sort of have these thoughts about, you know, would some, you see somebody in need, can you influence their mental health? Can you help them get off of drugs? Is that something that human beings can really do for each other? And so I'm wondering for each of you, if you think that this film what you personally believe about that and if you feel like this film answers that question can you can you save a life i don't think the film answers that question but it raises the question uh, and i think that uh, i would like to hear uh, Carl Bakil, what do you think about is it is that possible no i don't think it's possible I'm not sober because of Benjamin, and I'm so not sober because of Barbara. Of course, it helped, but I'm sober because of myself and because I started to love myself again. That's a good answer. <laughs> yep. What do you think, Barbara? Can you save a life? No, but I can be there when somebody tries to save oneself. Well, thank you so much for doing this interview. This film's so powerful and um, I just love it. And I think people are gonna really appreciate it. Um, thank you uh, for, I think it's difficult to open up your lives in this way to a documentary filmmaker. So Roberto and Barbara, thank you so much. For Benjamin, thank you so much for being sensitive. <laughs> It sounds like you're a wonderful guy to make a film with. <laughs> thank you for that. I don't know about that, but uh, I would also like to thank, of course, Barbara and Carl Bakil that let me tell their stories. Bertil, did you get another tattoo? Is that another tattoo I see on your face? Yeah. 
Give us a close up, Becky. Nice. Give us a close up. Wow. And, and talk while you have the close up, or, or else we, don't, we won't see you. Oh, uh, can you Celtic? see me now? Looks yeah. <laughs> I'm already thinking about how to put that in our new painting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very too. much. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.